Hello, and welcome to Public Key, the podcast from Chainalysis. I'm your host, Ian Andrews. If you're an investment firm or a traditional financial institution looking to dip your toes into the sometimes icy waters of the digital asset market, where do you turn for a secure way to enter the space? In this episode, I'm joined by John Menino and Alexander Zuck, also known as AZ, who are the Chief Compliance Officer and Chief Information Security Officer of SFOX to answer this exact question. They discuss security and transparency of open blockchains and the crucial role that SFOX plays as a prime dealer for institutions in the digital asset industry. John and AZ also go in depth on customer protection, digital asset insurance, and bankruptcy protection for crypto customers, while chiming in on safety measures for DeFi and the current regulatory situation in the US. I hope you enjoyed our Live from Links podcast series brought to you by our friends at Deloitte. As you listen to this, we're putting the final touches on episodes recorded our European event, so Live from Links will be back soon. In the meantime, head to the show notes to catch replays of the best content from that conference, or go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel where you'll get access to all the best content as soon as it's ready. Today, I'm joined by a duo from SFOX, John Menino, Chief Compliance Officer, and AZ, Alexander Zuck, Chief Information Security Officer. Gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, really excited for this. John, stalking a little bit on LinkedIn in preparation for the conversation, you spent a lot of time in traditional finance. Goldman Sachs, I think, was pretty prominent on your CV. How did you go from that into cryptocurrency? What drew you in down the rabbit hole, if you will? It's actually pretty funny. You know, when I when I look back sort of, you know, during my time and tenure at Goldman, in some ways, I feel like All roads were leading to crypto in some way, shape or form in various different forms and and factions, if you will. I started like in a treasury function and I was like in New York and then I moved to Zurich actually for a few years. And so was very involved in kind of like the banking side and the money movement side of things. And really, you know, at that time really saw like a lot of the challenges around just what was involved in moving money around the world and a lot of the challenges that were sort of associated with this. And this is way before Bitcoin started or anything along those lines. From that period, then I actually moved to London for a few years and was focused on a client asset role and a client protection role. And, you know, this whole kind of concept of segregation of client assets and firm assets, which was just sort of a true precursor to all of the FTX sort of situation that we just sort of have very recently now with this. And then, you know, and after sort of a few years there, I kind of moved back to New York and really got involved in the derivative side of the business. If you look at kind of what happened with derivatives and the derivative market, it was this market that was a lot of unknowns, a lot of complexity. People didn't understand it, but people were making a ton of money and it was very unregulated. All of these things kind of just really sort of paralleled a very sort of crypto focused environment. I was there, you know, during the whole kind of 2008 financial crisis. And again, this was really, really a very enlightening time to kind of be in the traditional finance world, especially at Goldman, right, where, you know, we were facing off against AIG, we were facing off against Lehman Brothers, we were facing off against Bear Stearns. And my team, you know, we were responsible, we were in the in the derivative side of things, we were all about collateral management and risk and all of those things. And so it became a very much a focus around what are we doing and how are we protecting our clients and how are we protecting ourselves from what was kind of happening in a macro environment. And post that time was when all of the regulatory environment sort of began to really sort of change. But this was then really the birth kind of of crypto. And I remember kind of a few people at work kind of starting to talk about this and starting to talk about Bitcoin and XRP and a couple of these others. And I remember buying my very first cryptocurrency at that point. But I was like, that's it, right? Like once, we, you know, <laughs> you know, because I was so used to so much stuff in the traditional finance world and the settling and the multiple days and all of these things. And it's like, what do you mean? I, like, I have it already. You're like, and, <laughs> and that is like what really started, I would say, the rabbit hole, right? Because then I was... Yeah really fascinated by kind of how this worked and the blockchain technology. And 
how blockchain technology will really change the world, not just cryptocurrency, the underlying technology around kind of how we live our everyday lives. And so, you know, when I left Goldman, we had first started a crypto desk and it was a very small and they kind of doing some trading there. And the kind of the very, very first sort of like crypto winter where people just really backed off and really just sort of said, you know what? I don't know about this. This might be a fad, you know, and you look at the whole other organizations and, you know, JP Morgan and Jimmy Dimon was, you know, nowhere near on board with any of this. And people were calling it a fad and, you know, it's going to go away in a couple of years. And so a lot of people retreated. And when I kind of left, there was a big sort of retreat in the marketplace because people just, number one, I think just didn't really sort of fully understand it. And number two, were really just very unsure around kind of what was going to be happening. I was sort of like a very, very big firm believer in it, but I kind of backed away. And so I would say that was really sort of like how my career kind of yeah. landed sort of where I am. But then the, the rabbit hole that I sort of went down. <laughs> Every step prepared you for this moment of the crypto industry. It's amazing. Now, AZ, you you similar background, right? You were at Salman Brothers long ago, Citibank for, for a long time. So you also draw from this traditional finance world, but rather than compliance like John, you're coming at it from the security background. I have to imagine one of the most stressful jobs in all of financial services is being a CISO in the crypto industry these days. Tell us a little bit about your, your journey to this moment with S Fox. How did you end up here? Thank you. I started as an engineer. And so looking and work, having a vantage point of one of the world's largest financial services organizations, on one hand, I've seen technology throughout my career emerge through the different phases where people started connecting computers together. The computers became something more meaningful to a regular human being rather than just a, an academics and were locked in a lab. And then the networking happened. And then all of a sudden, the biggest financial services organizations realized that this is the world and it's a new thing. But as I protected those emerging networks, which quickly grew in sophistication, on the other side of things, there was always the part of finance, which was considered super critical. The centuries old plumbing, you do not touch that. The trucks with cash still need to go around and certain things only certain banks can do. And the reason they can do certain banks, only certain banks, because that plumbing was put long ago. And that's why these banks are important, untouchable, etc. As a technologist, I always had had the curiosity of why that? Why that? In parallel, I see things emerging and things grow in sophistication. They become smaller, cooler, more beautiful. And then the old plumbing the don't touch one. And at that dichotomy, it was clearly only a matter of time, logically speaking, now looking back for it and saying that, oh, somebody will go and figure out, hey, look, we can do it simpler and try something like this. But if we go back to the roots of how it all started, it was not about the currency. It was about solving fundamental transparency problem, transparency and trustworthiness that is implicit in something. And so it was so elegant when it first appeared. But I also came from the lands of somebody who has been responsible for security of financial transactions. One thing that I was familiar from the early days is that there are certain agencies such as Secret Service that monitor the safety of American financial system. And, you know, the first reading of Bitcoin paper was for me, actually, maybe somewhat unusual. I was like, ooh, 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 I understand why these people remained anonymous because who knows? There was for a while, I recall, in the media this air that, hey, this thing is iffy. This thing is spooky. And we got to figure out what it is that is. But as I've seen it emerge and, and align with the rest of the world in terms of technological pro progression, ease of use and sophistication, it became clear. It's almost unimaginable that it could have gone any other way. So here I am logically connected to this where I find myself. And you started the question with, well, you know, CISO job is a stressful job to begin with. Crypto space had a little bit of a additional excitement to that. <laughs> One of my favorite people in the CISA world, Steve Katz, once said to in front of my students when they asked, well, you know, how do you sleep at night? He said, well, I'm sleeping like a baby. I just wake up every three hours and cry. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> 
I try not to disturb my family with my sobs in the night, but ultimately, given where we operate, the space gives a certain amount of thrill, certainly, but it also forces one to be restless in, in, in what I do and, and humble in what I do. I fully realize that the technologies that we work with are emerging, that there are a lot of actors who would like to benefit from some disruptions in those technologies in different ways sometimes not so nicely and that's just another day in the office yeah that's right i was reflecting with our ceo michael groninger recently on the the good old days of crypto long before i got into the space but he like both of you has has been in and around crypto for for over a decade and he pointed out that it used to be fairly routine that large exchanges would suffer you know hacking incidents or or lost funds of some sort and he goes you really don't hear about that anymore like that's a that's a very rare incident now obviously the attackers i think have have shifted uh, into the DeFi space and and maybe grown some of the, the theft activity. But I think it's a testament to people like yourself who have come in and brought a level of maturity to the the operational security of of the organization and the protection of client funds. John, a question for you. Maybe S Fox I think plays this critical role as a as a prime dealer for institutions across the crypto ecosystem. We probably have some listeners there that aren't really familiar with the business because they're not operating in that in that institutional context. Can you give us a rundown of like, what does SFOX do? How did the company come about? And where does it provide most value in the ecosystem today? I would say just to level set right here a little bit, like SFOX is an acronym, right? It stands for San Francisco Open Exchange. So oftentimes people are like, what, you know, what exactly does that mean? <laughs> I know? thought it was just a lot of people in crypto like dogs, you know, you, you guys went with a fox. I had no idea. <laughs> No, actually, uh, the F stands for Super Fox. So, yeah. <laughs> and our two founders, they created this company back in, in 2014, right? And so I often joke, you know, that we are sort of somewhat of an elder statesman in, in the crypto space because, you know, we've been around for a while and we've sort of seen a few of these crypto winters, if you will. The genesis of kind of how it all kind of came about was one of our co-founders kind of came from the Airbnb organization and helped launch Airbnb as a product and was really responsible for kind of a lot of the, the payments side of things around kind of how payments would operate with that. And then another one of our co-founders was really sort of focused and had done a lot of algorithmic trading applications. And both of you guys were your typical kind of nerdy computer guys, <laughs> kind of has a very sort of similar Silicon Valley startup, two guys, you know, in a garage building out this kind of company. And the idea really kind of came about was because people were just starting to begin to trade cryptocurrencies in a larger scale. And if you think about some basics around kind of in the traditional finance world and you want to buy some shares of Apple, you go and you buy it in one place, right? You go to your brokerage account, you buy it in one place, you go to NASDAQ and you purchase it and it's on that one exchange, right? And that's the price that you kind of get pretty straightforward. But when you trade crypto, right, you could buy it across multiple different exchanges. And it became very clear and very evident that there was a great case for arbitrage here, right? Where a slight price differential between one exchange and another exchange opened up a great opportunity to have a business model that could really take advantage of the ARB that sort of sits there between those two exchanges or multiple exchanges. This was the original Bitcoin trade, right? It was the, the US-Japan ARB, right? Where exactly I wasn't around for that, but as read about it, it sounds like that was how a ton of people in the 2014 era made quite a lot of money, was exploiting that price differential between the two markets. That's right. Right. And so that's yeah. kind of was the basis of everything here. And the idea specifically around kind of S Fox, right, was, OK, what if we had a place where you had one account and you had access to all of these different exchanges? Plus, in addition, you know, maybe some OTC providers, too, who are actually also trading out there. And let me have a one stop shop where you can trade all of your crypto, know that you're getting a best price, know that you could provide some liquidity 
to your customers and to your clients in the event that something was not so liquid. And you had this great opportunity to kind of take advantage of it all. And that's really the genesis of around kind of how it started. And the idea really with this, right, was the open exchange concept was we're going to make this available to everybody, anybody and everybody. Now, our, our focus tends to be more on institutional clients, but the idea here specifically was this is available to anyone and we can make this available to anyone. I've had kind of discussions before internally here of like, okay, you know, do we want to put some limits on things? Like, do we want to say like you need X amount to kind of open up an account or anything like that to kind of focus on this? And it's been very clear and the message to me was, has always been like that goes against sort of our original kind of concept here around making this an open exchange for everybody. And so that's the idea really is to have it be an open exchange where you can get best execution and great liquidity through sort of your, like your core kind of trading activity. We can talk a little bit about sort of how that model has evolved and other products and lines that are there, but from a core genesis of how the company started, like that's exactly kind of how it, how it began. That's awesome. And looking at the website, you've wired together 30 liquidity providers across 80 markets. And I'm assuming, you know, hundreds of uh, retail exchanges kind of tied into that and maybe some some OTC desks or quite a few of those as well. But I didn't realize like I can actually come in and sign up as a client directly and, and get access to the same network, the same trading capabilities. 100%. Super cool. Yeah. That's a pretty yeah. unique business model. I'm not aware of anybody else who's got that truly op open nature. I really like like that. Alex, one thing on my mind, just had the Lynx conference here in New York a couple of weeks ago. And happily, I think a lot of the discussion was around customer protection, both from hacks, like we see with Lazarus Group kind of running amok, uh, stealing as much crypto as they can, and things like ransomware, which had been you know on everybody's mind maybe two years ago, but also more focus on protection of, of individual client funds, almost saving people from themselves a little bit when it comes to some of these more sophisticated financial scams and phishing attempts. How do you think about that in the space? And I, I guess since you, you really have both institutional and potentially retail clients, what are you doing to make sure that your customers aren't mistakenly running into one of these schemes and losing a bunch of very valuable digital assets? Napoleon once famously said, never stop an enemy in the process of making a mistake. I think we do a complete reverse here, right? Uh, always do your best to stop your customer from <laughs> from making a mistake and the best way to do so is to do so proactively to do so strategically it starts with basic human empathy we all are human actors we have been in risk management for a long time and as fox beside the magic of being an all-in-one provider of that increased liquidity that comes with different choices and sophistication of tooling that we offer that is indeed unmatched but before all of that and that that's the ethos of the organization, as John described it, is that why do I need to carry three pagers and four phones when I'm trying to communicate to the world? I've been there <laughs> as a technologist, we, but that doesn't have to be that way. And that starts with empathy. So same thing, security starts and begins with empathy. You know, somewhere in between, there is a lot of very rigorous, very pragmatic risk management, a lot of what ifs, a lot of doing your best at night and otherwise of thinking what some of the unknowns that we're still not aware of, but ultimately waking up and doing something about it. Okay, here are the things that our customers should have, and here are the things that our customers are likely to to do differently or try to put themselves into a pickle, if you will. And also listening to people, right? Active listening is still very much there, technology or otherwise, because every time there is a stream of somebody coming in with something, well, listen, I'm involved directly in all of these conversations with customers seeking help, which we also use as a feedback loop for making our product safer, our messaging clear. I love the approach. One of the things that I'm very interested in, I think this is topical, right, as we've all watched kind of the banking crisis unfold is, and the question about FDIC insurance on uh, on retail deposits at banks, is this, I think, new for you all, bankruptcy protected digital asset insurance. What is that solution? What is, who's that for? What, is it, what does it do for us? 
just to be clear, right, this is not FDIC insurance. Like, I don't want to get in trouble by any of our regulators. But what, what we offer, right? So, so we recognized this a, a while ago, and we began looking at a couple different options here, right? And so one of the things I would sort of say several years ago we began looking at is becoming actually a trust company. And so we have a division now, which is a Wyoming based trust company through the Wyoming division of banking that has oversight by them. And one of the things we looked at really kind of early on was how can we offer some kind of protection, if you will, for our clients in this space way before kind of the whole kind of FTX debacle kind of happened. And this was really around having a custody sort of solution, the ability to have a clear custody model for our clients in this space. And so what we have done and kind of, and really what sort of what we've created is we have this trust company now, which, you know, has, does have regulatory oversight by the Wyoming Division of Banking. And really what this does is it offers bankruptcy protection in very much in the unlikely event that we were to go bankrupt. Those assets are clearly ring fenced and protected against the sort of the general creditors sort of situation. With FTX, it was all just one big commingled mess. So all of FTX's customers are in line with the general creditors of kind of everybody else. And so there was no segregation, there was no protection. If those customers get anything, you know, it'll probably be pennies on the dollar through the whole kind of bankruptcy unwind. This again, kind of goes back, circles all the way back to, you know, again, my client asset, client protection kind of background a little bit here where there is clear segregation and clear differentiation between firm assets and client assets. And this is a really, really big deal, right? And it's interesting, you know, because before sort of FTX, customers and clients came to us all the time and like, how do I get best execution? How do I have good liquidity? They were laser focused on that. <laughs> Post FTX, suddenly everything shifted and they're like, how do I ensure that my assets are safe, that I'm not going to just lose everything tomorrow? And that's really, really what this offering provides is it offers custody protection and bankruptcy protection through custody and a go for it basis. And then what we said is we believe that like this is sort of like somewhat of a fundamental right for you, for people to have. And so what we've done is we've made this offering free, right? Which is really pretty unheard of in the industry for our clients up to $250,000 worth of assets under management. We still offered a protection above that, right? And there's just sort of, you know, a, a tiered fee structure. But for the average investor, right, like this is just sort of like a no brainer. This is like free protection, right, in the event of bankruptcy. And so like you can come to us, you can get best execution, you can get great liquidity, and you have this ability to have ensuring that your assets are protected. And this is really, really, really important for us. And we feel like that this is somewhat of a big game changer for the industry. I think it's terrific. I've had a couple of conversations recently. We we have an upcoming episode of the podcast with the CEO of MX Global, which is one of the leading exchanges out of Malaysia. I think they're one of four registered exchanges in the country. And he was making the point that there, this is the standard rule. Yeah, full segregation on both the custodial side from the exchange operation and also on the fiat on-ramp, off-ramp. So they can't actually take customer fiat, the ringgit in his case, directly directly from the customers, there has to be a third party payments intermediary. And so they're, you know, kind of left and right hands are, are tied off. And it it completely avoids what we've seen where the there was kind of a blending of the assets of the exchange with the assets of the customer and then losses are commingled and it's very hard to untangle. You know, this trend seems like it will be one of the big outcomes from the experience of last year is, hey, we, we really want to have some separation, some hard walls between these two things. Even if in your case, it's still part of the organization, there's clear policy and operational controls, I think, that probably are net good for the consumer at the end of the day. And I love the guarantee of protection there being free to anybody up to 250. I mean, that's just such a peace of mind. Gets us all back to sleeping like babies where we only wake up every three hours to cry about the state of the crypto market. AZ, we, uh, 
We recently had the CISO from Coinbase joined us at our Lynx conference recently. He was on the podcast. We talked a lot about how the advantage that he had at Coinbase was that Brian Armstrong hired him when I think they were a team of 10 or 12 people, something like that, very early in the trajectory of the company. And so before there was a lot at risk, he could start building the foundation of the, the organization from a security perspective. And over the years, you know, they've always treated that as priority number one. I gathered, you know, very similar to your your organization as well. I'm curious to hear kind of like over the time that you've been at SFOX, like how have you seen security across the industry improve and, and particularly anything that, that you feel like you've done at SFOX that, that sets you up in this kind of world-class position as a leading and safe platform? First of all, I want to tap a little bit back on the question that you and John discussed prior, which is custody protection and and the bankruptcy protection. One thing that is very easy to miss in this or assume that it was always there, but I think it's very fundamental. And it also was a decisive factor for me before I joined SFOX is that, look, these things do not happen overnight or even over a few months. So it's not something like we looked at FTX, we said, oh, that would be a nice little add-on to slap on on our product. No, 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 that's not. This is actually something that has been on the minds of our leadership. When you speak with our CEO, you will hear that concern for the consumers and, and, and users of our product. It's been there for a long time. It takes a lot of time and effort, mutual effort, to align yourself with new regulatory requirement and get that done. So we have been doing this preparation for custody protection way before FTX happened. Just, you know, so that's number one. Number two, that is actually the spirit that is decisive. One of the professional hazards, if you will, for any CISO coming in to a new organization. And yes, I was lucky to be the first CISO at SFOX, which is again only building something from ground up up is a very exciting journey that I have taken several times over and but it is also a humbling one you always need to focus on what's most important but one of the professional risks for a CISO is coming in and becoming a poster CISO well we need a CISO why do we need a CISO because they say we need a CISO we need to show to the world that we need a CISO one of the ways to evaluate for the real versus poster level interest in having a CISO is having these detailed conversations with the co-founders, with the CEO of the company and aligning the reporting structure, et cetera, et cetera. This is all in place at SFOX as any CISO would dream about. I work directly with the CEO and whenever I read another article, well, CISO should have a seat at the table. Oh, I'm lucky to have to say that I have a trimmed seat. It's actually more like an armchair. My CEO listens to what I have to say. My leader team uh, listens to what I have to say. And when we talk about another exciting thing that is also, I think, is very special about the young organizations like ours is that you know, when we talk about sizing, I think it's very disproportional. I don't want to denigrate necessarily the more classical, more established organization, but I think it's fairly to say that every single individual that works in a smaller team like ours is probably worth five to ten people productivity and brain-wise in more traditional, more established settings. Just goes with the territory. And so whenever I talk about smaller team sizes, etc., I'm very tempted to say, hey, let me tell you about the team. I can put one of these people in the room and they will probably run circles around an average 10 you can pick. But with that said, it's a great learning environment. Again, it's so wonderful to be among people where you are not the smartest person in the room and it's enabling that kind of crowd and doing it for a noble purpose of, well, keeping people's assets secure and making it more secure from day to day, however incremental the progress is. It's a dream job. That's so cool. I love the focus on team and being able to lead, recruit, and put the right people in the right places to make them successful. That's a terrific strategy. John, one thing I'm curious about, the last year it's been hard to tell which way the market's going for crypto, for equities, for everything. But in crypto specifically, I think a lot of us are trying to judge the rate of global adoption, right? I'm a fan of the graph that kind of charts the number of people in crypto and the number of people that adopted the internet starting back 
in the 90s and kind of in 1999, if you will, right about now in terms of equivalent adoption phases. So maybe we just went through the big dot com crash or maybe we're about to encounter it. I'm not sure. But a lot of people ask me like, hey, what's going on with the banks? The traditional big financial players. Since your business deals so much with institutional, maybe you have some insight on this. I struggle to reconcile, you know, the headlines. You mentioned Jamie Dimon earlier. He's clearly no fan of crypto. But then on the other hand, you've got Bank of New York and State Street and Fidelity all moving into the space, seemingly unfazed by the headlines in the in the news. What's your take on this? I guess we should uh, we should all be following Matt Damon's lead, right? Where he told us the <laughs> fortune favors the brave. Right? <laughs> I think there's some organizations who historically have kind of always been sort of like on the sidelines and there's so much uncertainty specifically in the regulatory environment. And you could kind of see this with just what's happening more broadly and kind of a lot of the push that's kind of happening to the SEC specifically in this space, especially since they have kind of really taken the stance of this true sort of regulation by enforcement, as opposed to kind of actually kind of creating some specific rules that we could all follow. And so some of the players are sort of like, okay, well, you know what? We're going to wait on the sidelines. We're going to wait till the dust settles. And then we're going to see what, and then, you know, we'll see what happens. But for me, I kind of look at this again, sort of bringing this back to like the derivative space where you had players that really sort of established themselves early on in the derivatives market and really got themselves well entrenched in that space. And I'm not saying that, you know, all those players, you know, didn't make mistakes sort of along the way, but they really sort of established themselves as sort of the leads. And while others then after the fact are now kind of have always been just sort of in that catch up space, right? And trying to kind of catch up with with others. I think you're going to have some big kind of key leaders. And then I think you're going to have some of these larger organizations really, really struggling to then try and play catch up and kind of capture this market. But I think for me, the thing that really just sort of stands out here is is just that there is an acceptance that this is a new asset class and that if we don't build and move forward with what's happening in this space, people will be left behind. Organizations will be left behind. And I think that's why you're sort of seeing sort of some of the bigger players and some of these industry leaders in other industries come forward and say, we're not going to miss this boat. The banking side of things has also just been kind of a, a crazy sort of situation then too. When you look at a couple of these banks like Silvergate, Signature, right? One of the, the big reasons why these banks were so favored in the crypto industry was they acknowledged the 24-7 nature of crypto and crypto trading and kind of the future of this. And they developed and innovated products that enabled the movement of fiat to occur on that schedule. They saw a problem in the traditional banking world and they addressed it and they focused on it. And I find it really sort of interesting that these banks were kind of really punished for innovating in a manner that really looked towards what we needed as the whole kind of industry sort of evolved. Ironically, right, is is like then you have this whole new Fed product called like Fed Now, which is basically exactly what these guys have been doing, right? And so I think that there's been undue pressure that has been placed upon these organizations because of their association with crypto. And again, I think that is because they are disruptors in this traditional finance world. And while they may no longer be around, there are going to be other banks that are going to kind of step up and move into this arena. And when we look back at history in this space, I think, you know, we will look back at those organizations as being part of the trailblazers that help sort of shift and change the way that we do traditional banking and the way that we use crypto on a go-forward basis. Great perspective. AZ, I'm, I'm curious, we've touched on DeFi a couple times. How, how do you all look at DeFi? I mean, I, I would guess that, oh, it's a source of liquidity. It's a trading venue, just like any other. We're going to wire them all together. That must apply a different set of security risks, right? With another exchange or a trading desk, you can kind of look the counterparty in the eye and you know what you're getting into. 
that doesn't exist in the world of DeFi, right? There might be a DAO organization. There might be some anonymous operators. It's hard to, to nail it down to a corporation. Like, how do you all approach this? How are you thinking about DeFi if you haven't gotten into it yet? First of all, I think the risk management practices, if you're serious about it, are the same. And yeah. I might say that looking, at least in certain cases, looking in the eyes of the counterparty should not be the sufficient, by itself sufficient, the determinant <laughs> of, okay, I can Very trust much this agree. person. Very much agree. Right? Yeah. So, and <laughs> especially if they look pretty and all of that other stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> Instead, there is a multidimensional risk analysis process, right? You look at somebody, go past the shiny interface past the white paper that says here's how we're going to change the world and start looking at the more boring but ultimately fundamental way of okay all right do you have a security program in place have you had any blips or maybe independent assessments of that security done recently and then it kind of all falls in place and we do that from multiple dimensions i do my part my colleagues do theirs and it adds additional thrill when you can tell who the people are behind the thing but as an information security professional there are ways to find out more about the people you just do your best right there is public information all over the place and there are some implicit factors you can gather to get a fair amount of confidence that you can do certain things with this business you can assign certain level of risk or certain grade of risk to this particular technology or this particular product. And then we decide to go from there based on business assessment. It, ma it makes total sense, right? I mean, it, it's just another trading venue on some level. So you, you run this the same counterparty risk modeling that you would on, on others. Gentlemen, we're, we're running low on time. I, I want to ask one last question. I would be remiss, I think, to let you go without talking about the state of regulations here in the U.S. at the current moment. It's a complex landscape. It feels like financial regulators are kind of catching up after the, the chaos of last year and, and now bringing you know, a fair amount of confusion to the market about what's actually allowed, what's not allowed, what even are these digital assets that we're spending so much time thinking and, and talking about. How does SFOX view the situation? You're obviously a U.S.-based company today. We're hearing some rumors about people, you know, Backing up and moving to a different different jurisdiction potentially as as one solution. How's this affecting your business? What's your perspective and outlook? What should we expect over the next year? What I will say is is that I spend most of my day kind of focusing in around a lot of these types of issues. We are an international business, so we are, you know, these global kind of regulations definitely impact us. I look at it from a, a couple different lenses, right? Number one, I find it amazing that the U.S. has struggled so much to kind of get its act together, especially when you look at something like what's happening in Europe and the passage of the, the MECA legislation, you know, you're talking about the European Union, 27 different countries, all of the complexity and the red tape that's a sort of associated with that. And yet this organization was now able to pass sort of global legislation that is going to impact, you know, the entire European Union and kind of how different businesses kind of around the globe will interact with European clients. So I feel like right now the, the U.S is clearly behind the ball in this space. I think sometimes, you know, you need to kind of tackle these things in bits and pieces. And so I think one of the first things that is being addressed and we'll likely sort of see in sort of short order is something around sort of stable coins, right? If you kind of go all the way back, right? And, you know, before the FTX implosion and everything like that. And again, the crazy thing with FTX, right? At the end of the day, like it really had nothing to do with crypto. It was good old fashioned fraud commingling of client assets and firm assets. You can look back not even that far to like MF Global, which was the last time that this big sort of situation sort of happened. It's virtually the same thing, right? It's just that the product that we, people were trading were crypto. But from a regulatory perspective, though, I think, you know, number one, right, is going to be the first thing we're going to see is some sort of stable coin legislation, right, which I, I believe we're going to see. And I think we're going to see um, the, you know, the prohi prohibition of algorithmic stable coins like Terra Luna was. And so to me, like that's the low hanging fruit, right? Like that's the easy stuff. I think people understand that people get it. I circle back to the derivatives world, right? Because we had a, you know, we had the implosion. We were able to kind of create something that looked at this. At the end of the day, what happened in the derivative space, I think is going to be very, very similar to what will probably happen in the crypto space. You have these 
these dual regulators overseeing different components of the market. In the derivative space, in the post Dodd Frank world, what happened was the CFTC had oversight over the vast majority of the derivatives markets, including you know interest rate swaps and commodities and all those things. And what the SEC had was they still have the oversight of derivatives if the underlying of the derivative is considered a security. And so that's kind of like this bifurcation of the CFTC kind of overseeing most of it, the SEC sort of overseeing a component of it that has a security component. What needs to happen then is a codification of what constitutes a security from a a token perspective versus what is a commodity. And that's the whole thing, right? Is like, we don't need whole kind of huge new rule set and everything like that. You can make this work with the existing infrastructure and framework that we have. You just need clear definitions and you need to reach a consensus. And that is what we don't have right now because you have the chair of the SEC saying basically everything's a security, right? And then you have the CFTC kind of going after organizations like Binance who are basically saying, you, you fall under or kind of like these, these commodity rules. And so everyone's like, well, where do I turn? And what do I do? And who do I look towards? We are not doing ourselves any favors by not making forward progress on this and not someone stepping up to bat and saying like, this is what we need. Like I said, we don't need to create something whole and brand new. We can really sort of use what we have. We just need some clear guidelines on it. That's an amazing place to wrap. I've heard that same sentiment from so many guests on this show, which is we're legitimate business operators. We care about consumer protection. We want to follow the rules. We see legitimate value in the in the business services we're providing. Just give us the rules in a way that we can actually abide by them. And we're happy to play ball. So I love the perspective. AZ, John Menino, thanks so much for joining us on Public Key. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Hey there. Thanks for listening to another amazing episode. Our team at Chainalysis has been working extremely hard to put out terrific content on all the major platforms. So if you haven't done it already, head down to the show notes and make sure you sign up to follow us on TikTok. Take a look at our revamped YouTube channel and subscribe. Visit us on LinkedIn. And of course, follow us on Twitter. Last thing before you go, the Department of Treasury Office of Foreign Asset Control has been working overtime the last several weeks, focusing their efforts on sanctions targeting notorious cyber criminals and money launderers. A number of these sanctions have intersected with cryptocurrency. If you haven't been following along, on April 24th, OFAC sanctioned three individuals operating in China for facilitating North Korean cryptocurrency money laundering activities used to fund weapons of mass destruction and missile programs. Then on May 16th, OFAC sanctioned Mikhail Mativ, a Russian national associated with development and spread of several ransomware strains, which reportedly cost victims as much as $200 million. And then on May 19th, OFAC sanctioned 22 individuals and 104 entities operating in over 20 countries for their role in facilitating Russian sanctions evasion. For the full story behind these sanctions, and more details on the exposure in the cryptocurrency world, check out the links to the blogs found in the show notes.